limitations like not in the experiment is characterized as a not in the experiment by the well like the simple experiments i don't know Okay, today we're going to skip ahead just a little bit. The complex variable stuff is a long chapter 10. I'm going to jump to 12 uh, right here. We looked at those pieces of 11 last time. But the main thing I want to do is get started on the partial differential uh, calculus of Hamiltonians, Lagrangians. Um, also make an analogy with thermodynamics. Thermodynamics is the course that people say you have to take an infinite number of times before you understand it. Um, I think there is some truth to that, and part of it is just a problem with um, understanding the details of partial derivatives. Now, you may think you know all of that, and I'm going to review it anyway, um, and certainly uh, down here we've got some stuff. I can't find it in any other textbook about this uh, Lagrangian-Hamiltonian relationship and uh, contact transformations. These are things they talk about, but they don't explain what's contacting what. And this is even true of many of the Russian texts, and they're the best texts on, on, the, on mechanics that I know of. But finally, at the end of this, I want to look at something that's really pretty. You see it on the uh, far screen there. And I call it the volcanoes of Eo. But it's also the atoms of mist. This is poetry for physics, okay? Uh, this is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and they uh, make uh, to clocks that require something that's not moving. So they have atoms that uh, are ex sort of explode, make a circle, and they fall in gravity, and they catch them right at the top. So uh, we're going to see some uh, of very elementary sophomore physics, but it's beautiful. It's just cool. It's, it's really, I think it's one of the coolest things uh, um, going <clears throat> that I can present to you now. Okay, so let's begin uh, in making sure that uh, we all have a pretty good idea of uh, what uh, happens with a lake, uh, Beaver Lake Boathouse. Um, and I'm going to zoom through this after you see what it is that uh, you have already done, I assume, in a course like uh, our Calculus 3. But basically it is to make uh, a derivation of the symmetry of partial derivatives and also the chain rule that's used to expand uh, a, a total derivative as a sum of partials. So these are pretty simple st stuff, but the idea uh, should be uh, done right now because we're going to do something that's a little bit more advanced to it. In any case, the idea is that this is some surface that I've broken down into finite intervals and we're just doing a first order approximation uh, of the uh, thing. And we're looking at what would happen if I uh, ask what is the value of this function right here. So I start walking in the x direction, that involves a partial derivative with respect to x, and partial means that all of the other independent variables have not changed, so I have to stay on this red line. And then uh, the other way that we go is uh, this way, but before we do that, uh, here we go, uh, right there, this is partial with respect to y, a little different number because it's a little different slope than that. Okay, so you're looking at an approximation for the function here, and you're looking at an approximation for the function values there. And uh, then you say, okay, uh, we got this far, you might as well go the rest of the way, so you need to find the, the slope up there as best you can along that little section there, and that involves a, uh, this little quantity right here, which has its own expansion. And uh, when you add those two together, you should have a pretty good idea of what the value of the function is at that point. But just to check that, we go along here and then up there, and that involves a, another expression that's a little different from this one. So it's just a question of matching uh, these things, putting them all together. 
And that's what's going on right here. I'm doing one uh, there. That's the complete answer up to uh, a second order, but here's the first order stuff. And then uh, we do it the other way. Same deal. I've got the first order stuff and I've got the second order stuff. Now this is all stuff that you've seen before, right? So it doesn't help to see it again. We're not going to spend uh, 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 too long on that. But what we want are these two results. And the first one, the, the uh, chain rule that we'll be using, and I have to give you all the notations for that eventually. That'll be down at the bottom here. But the basic idea is that you turn uh, these things uh, in as many ways as you can. So basically, we're taking this thing right here and writing it. Uh, first, the one that came out over there, and then finally uh, this one. Okay, and notice that this guy right here, same as that guy, so I can switch those. That's just a question of something to think. But this is the one that's really in question here. And what you can see uh, from all of this is that if this uh, boathouse is not suffered from a hurricane in which it, it uh, causes uh, you to uh, end up here by going this route and ending up, say, up here by going that route, if that hasn't happened, then we've got the symmetry. That's really what it boils down to. So just asking if you're not on some kind of weird cut. Okay? That's the, the, the basic, the easiest way I can say that. So, uh, let's just look here at the chain rule. That's partial x dx, partial y dy. We've only got two variables, so that's in, but dot, 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 dot. The mechanics that could go for quite a while. Uh, here is the the f dt, if you're talking about uh, a time derivative, okay? Instead of dx, I get the dx dt, the dy dt. And then, this is the notation that many books just start with, and it's really annoying if you haven't thought all this through. Uh, they just put x dot, and we'll do that. From now on, time derivatives, uh, very often in, in our uh, work, will just be dot, okay? So that, it can be a little annoying because dots are small and they might not show up uh, on uh, some of our screens. So that's uh, important. And then the symmetry, okay? The idea that it didn't make any difference whether I did this or this should get the same result. Uh, that's a, a second uh, result uh, that uh, uh, is important for uh, what we're doing here, okay? Now, the shorthand notation for partials and this is, I think, Jackson, a little bit shorthand derivative, partial with respect to x, partial with respect to y, sometimes used. So there's this total shorthand notation that will occur a lot of times uh, in what we do, uh, especially as we get into the uh, units 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. So uh, this one right here, very important, uh, the symmetry uh, that involves a continuous function uh, at uh, everywhere that we've traveled. And then there's the other notations. Uh, this one, I think, ends up in the cellar there. So let's look at this one. Uh, here, we're talking about the, the Gibbs notation for uh, a vector of partial derivatives. Here's the shorthand notation. And then the uh, differential uh, that you really uh, are interested in, that is df, or total derivative with respect to time, if I put a dt under that. But right now, just this is what I'm interested in. These are notation. Here's the full matrix notation right here. Here it is written out with the shorthands for the partials. And that's the way Gibbs would uh, write it. Dot product of this thing, this vector here that consists of the x and the y uh, derivatives. Okay? Anything that you see that needs to be uh, said? Uh, say now or forever hold your peace. Okay. Just a quick reminder. Yeah. So in this notation, um, for the total derivative, is the partial derivative of, like right here, on this uh, right the here. partial of f with respect to x, is that also uh, in working on the dx part too? Well, all it's doing here is multiply. Okay. And good question. That is something that <laughs> could easily be confused. I mean, the answer is, this is all that's involved. This is just saying this thing is a, a function of whatever point. 
uh, we, we, we are dealing with. Okay. So, but absolutely good question. Um, that, that could easily be. Yeah, the, the, uh, one of the main things we're going to have with all the formulas that are on the wall there is making sure that we don't overstep the jurisdiction of a derivative. <clears throat> okay. Well, uh, let's do the geometry of this with respect to Hamiltonians and Lagrangians. Just to remind you, there were three ways that we could do the super ball problem. This turned out to be a very efficient way uh, for some things. So it reduced it to rotations and uh, easily visualized reflections. Uh, but um, we're going to mainly deal with the ones that, uh, at first here, that we encounter in all, all of the other uh, textbooks beside the, the bang one. So just to remind you of what we we're uh, doing yesterday, I'm sorry, Tuesday, uh, we were uh, talking about the uh, effect of scaling uh, of velocity. And then we came up with, uh, at that point, a operator that was scaling only by the square root. Okay, And that's what we're calling our uh, astrogen. So we introduced this uh, 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 before we got into all of that quadratic form stuff. But in any case, uh, it's a new quantity, this big V here that has a square root in front of it. Uh, rescaled by square root of m, it doesn't have a name. I don't know, speedinum or speedinium. <laughs> I don't know what you would call this big V here. But that's what you're using when you work with a uh, circle geometry associated with uh, this, this uh, a quantity that's halfway between the Lagrangian and the Hamiltonian in terms of uh, uh, rescaling the kinetic parts. This one has what we started this whole course with, and that was the conservation of the sum of the M MVs of the two or more uh, particles in independent collisions. So this one is a, a quadratic form that involves one over the mass. This is one that just involves the mass. Okay. So those were the uh, two quadratic forms that we looked at mostly when we did that uh, sort of mathematical uh, sojourn. Okay. So uh, having p squared over 2m instead of mv squared over 2 uh, is the name of the game here don't have this nice uh, form at all in anything that we'll be talking about uh, today. So, um, let's look at the equations that you might have, the partial differential equations that immediately suggest themselves here. And this is um, sort of a philosophical part of the partial derivative calculus. Uh, and it's, it's uh, I say it starts out with simple, simply requiring some sort of loyalty or fealty to the colors, all right? <laughs> um, uh, we have a president now who really needs this, okay? Uh, so uh, we should, uh, you know, maybe take a look at it uh, with respect to the parts of realism. And the idea is, but the Lagrangian, and it's true of Strangian too, has no explicit dependence on momentum. Momentum is something uh, else. That's the deal. So this is the, these are the first equations of mechanics coming out right here. And that is the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to P is identically zero. Now we have to flesh that out because it, 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 it rankers at you. Did you know the Lagrangians are really not independent of the momentum because uh, it's got velocities in it. The velocities depend on momentum in the, uh, this relationship here. So, uh, or this relation down here. Okay, I'm sorry, this one right here. So, um, we, we've got some work to do, but this is what, what we're going to do. The philosophy of this is to start with this. This equation right here is what the two sets uh, that are uh, others. Here the Hamiltonian has no explicit dependence on velocity. And then neither of these have explicit dependence on this stuff, but 
most people don't consider that stuff. So, but if they do, we need this one as well. Okay, so that's that's where we start here. So this is just some of the notation in our, our quadratic form discussion uh, being put in a place where we're going to uh, be using it. So um, I'm going to keep these guys jived so that we can do some uh, demonstrations and stuff uh, later on. Now, as I say here, in such a, such non-dependency, uh, that's what we're really doing here with these zeros, such non-dependency hold in spite of this thing I say, under the table matrix and partial derivative connections, okay? In other words, th this is non-dependency due to stationary value effects, and that's what we need to show. That's the hard part of this. That's what makes this work. But right now, we're just kind of, uh, 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 of uh, shall we say, winging it uh, by our idea of loyalty. This, when the Lagrangian is where it says it's velocity and never anything uh, else. And we're working Hamilton, it's momentum and never anything else. Now, it turns out nature really demands that. I'm going to show you why that is. That's a very physical thing. But math, it's just mathematical right now. Okay? So we have this gradient with respect to v. That's the partial derivative with L respect to the vector v, which is more than two dimensions and all of the stuff, pretty much all the stuff we'll be doing. But uh, th that's the idea right there. And uh, what it turns out, you see, is the partial derivative with respect to v of this, and we showed this at the very end of the last lecture. It's kind of like taking the derivative of v squared and uh, uh, getting two times v. Okay, so the two cancels here just to give me mv's. Take the partial respect to v and you either lop that one off or you lop that one off and get this. So there's our first Lagrangian equation. It's the partial derivative of L with respect to v is p. That's very simple, okay? That's a very simple idea. And then we do the same thing with the Hamiltonian. Okay, now the Hamiltonians instead of having an M matrix, got the M inverse matrix here. Okay? But same deal. Okay? What this one is telling us is that the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian, okay, that's this guy, okay, this guy, okay, partial derivative of that uh, gives me this. M inverse P, that gives me velocity. Okay? So that's Hamilton's first equation. So we're halfway through the course now in a sense, okay? Um, if I can get a laser pointer to point so I don't have to walk over there. Um, there we go. It's the UV one it seems to always work. There are Hamilton's equations right there. Lagrange's equations are, are sort of spread out here because the way we're going to do them, that's the way they come. But right now, we've got the first equation, uh, that's this one, of Hamiltonian. Partial h with respect to p equal q dot. That's velocity. Q is these uh, queer coordinates that we're, we're going to work with. Generalized coordinates. Curvilinear, not orthogonal. Okay? And then, uh, the other one is partial L here uh, with respect to velocity, that's Q dot is P. Okay, so this, these are primarily geometric relations. Okay, is this making a little bit of sense? It's not the way you probably learned the first time, but sorry. <laughs> this is a quick way in once we get it out of the way. All right? So what does it look like geometrically? We've already uh, looked at these pictures here. Now what I'm asking you to imagine really is a three-dimensional plot here that has contour lines on it for different altitudes of L. Okay, so it starts out at the bottom of the bowl, it comes out of the, of, the, of the screen at different levels that you would have, bigger and bigger ellipses, you know, on an elliptic paraboloid that's coming out of the screen here, okay? This one is the same thing, except that it's dealing with momentum P1 and P2, okay? So, uh, in a three-dimensional thing, there'd be a plane tangent to that hyperboloid Okay? And there'd be a vector normal to that, would be along this red line if you look at it from the top, and then the uh, 
the, uh, uh, the plane, it would just be a line on the plane, so the plane would be uh, tipped. So th this would work, uh, as, a, as we'll see later on, as a way to uh, visualize. But for now, we just look at the fact that it has a tangent in it normally. All right? And those are related through those first equations. That's the deal. Okay, those first equations down there uh, are, are right here. Here we have the uh, partial respect to V of the Lagrangian, which is a function only of V. That's giving me P. Okay? And P is perpendicular uh, to the tangent line of the Lagrangian. Okay? There's that uh, P. All right? But then, that P goes out, and that P belongs to the Hamiltonian. Here's the Hamiltonian. Okay? Right there, at a certain uh, level of energy. Okay, some contour of that Hamiltonian is right there. All right? And perpendicular to that is V. And then the tangent uh, to the Hamiltonian right here, which is perpendicular, is matched by the, the uh, tangent line uh, right here on the Lagrangian you see, uh, which has a normal that is P. So that's what we've got to deal with, the relationship between these two. That's the hard part of this. That's the crazy part of it that we're going to have to do here uh, right away, so basically. So um, if you're talking about uh, more and more mass, they won't be matched nicely like they, they will scale uh, accordingly. If you have less mass, you'll have a great big Lagrangian and a tiny little, uh, maybe matching the inside of the Lagrangian like we did in our forms. Uh, and then if you go uh, with uh, more mass, that is if the mass is higher, then typically uh, you will see uh, this situation here where the Hamiltonian is the large thing and the Lagrangian is small. Okay. So those are just uh, things to point out. That you Okay? But anyway, that's the first equation of Lagrange. That's the first equation of the Hamiltonian in a geometrical setting of, in this case, just two dimensions, but it's going to be general. Okay, now here's the cool thing. Now, usually this is stuff that comes at the end of a, of a classical mechanics course, so it's right at the end when the professor's rushing through the things because he didn't uh, space it right. And so you miss the beauty of Poincare. Now, Poincaré is the one that started the Barbakian revolution. He had great insights, and the students hated him for it. And that's where we got the breakup of the divorce of mathematics and physics in the French uh, 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 schools of uh, mathematical physics. It became separated. So we have to uh, do some hand-waving here, to say the least. And uh, I'm given this matrix relation between these two, so I'm really worried about the fact that I've said that the Hamiltonian is only a function of this one, and the Lagrangian is only a function of this one. What the heck does that mean? Uh, that they, they, they are they're connected. How can I uh, uh, even uh, 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 deal with that? But anyway, let's see if there's a way we can deal it by realizing that uh, I can write these things in several different ways. Uh, these are the quadratic forms that uh, uh, we uh, deal with for the Lagrangian and the Hamiltonian. Okay? But you, you might be tempted to rewrite uh, this as simply, since you can write a V as M inverse P, you can just put the V right there. Okay? You, that's tempting, isn't it? Okay. Or we can do it with this one. Okay. M dot V is P, so I could just go V dot P. Now the, the, this isn't quantum mechanics, so is those should be equal, right? At least it's not quantum mechanics yet. We're, we're, that's the real purpose of this course is to penetrate the barrier between classical and quantum. Anyway, there they are. Okay. These two relationships that are numerically correct, but f functionally, differentially, no way. So we got to settle the differential parts of the things. And remind us that in classical physics, we don't worry about the order of those two uh, guys. They're not operators yet. Okay? 
So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go, if I need to, uh, you know, write my Hamiltonian uh, and, and, and do a PV minus one half V dot P or P dot V, they're, they're both equal, I can do that. This right here is L. I can do P dot V minus L. So I'm doing Poincaré axiom at this point. Poincaré realized that he could do this as well, P dot V minus H, and lo and behold, if you do that, then it becomes differentially correct. So this is Legendre's contact transformation. We'll show what it's contacting what. So I'll have a bunch of tangents that are uh, doing some beautiful geometry. But uh, we'll start with uh, this guy right here, L equal P dot V minus H, or H equal P dot V minus L. Now if you look at the very top of our formula sheets over there, you find that I have an H is equal to, now it's a sum over all dimensions, P V. V is Q dot. Remember I said we put dots on them. Things are time your evidence total. And then minus L. So put your L on this side and your H here or either one of these. Okay? They're both, I would call, Poincare's identity. But it's also Legendre's, you see. This is a French operation here. The French connection is important here. Okay? Now let's check this thing. Is this working differentially? Okay? Let's take the P derivative of L. Okay, here's the answer I'm covering up. Partially with respect to P of P dot V, hmm, that's not zero. Uh, that's going to just give me V. And then I have minus partial derivative of H of P, partial derivative of H with respect to P. That's not, we haven't said that's zero. But we have said this is zero, and that's what works out. There's the first equation of Hamilton sitting right there by just looking at the derivative of it, of, of it with respect to P uh, Lagrangian. Same deal here, okay? So this is the hardest part of this uh, exercise here. This is where Poincaré excelled. I'm, I'm sure he must have thought about something like this in order to get his results. And it was just about the time when the students were really hate. So I'm being careful. Don't hate me. All right. Now let's look at look at these relationships um, in a, in, a, in a more uh, geometrical uh, fashion here, just to remind you uh, where we are on this. Okay. So that's where we are. We're, we're seeing uh, these as geometrical relations. The v velocity gradient of the Lagrangian, which is only a function of velocity, is p. And the p gradient of Hamiltonian, which is only a function of, of, of p, the momentum, is v. Pretty cool. Okay, that's what we're going to need uh, for this uh, course. Okay. Now, here is the geometry spell. If I look at these diagrams from the side, here's that paraboloid, just a section of it, for some velocity v pointing in some direction. And here's the Hamiltonian function, also a parabola, sitting there uh, as a function of momentum p, some momentum p, some direction in those diagrams. Okay? Now this one is, is numerically correct. We're very careful here to point out what it is true about this. For example, the actual velocity, that's this distance right here, velocity equal 1.0 okay, is equal to the slope, which happens to be 45 degrees, for this one, okay? The slope here, uh, that's the derivative of h with respect to p, and we only got one uh, dimension, so I can write d instead of partial here, but the geometry is what you're really looking for here in this uh, uh, cross-section of that uh, uh, three-dimensional object that's on that other screen, okay? So there's your, your um, you know, one to one, that's the, the, the slope of this thing. And the momentum, okay, here, 1.6 is the V slope. So these, 
back and forth here. The slope on this side makes the uh, ordinate over there. The slope over there makes the ordinate uh, over here. It makes, I'm sorry, the abscissa, uh, uh, the, the uh, independent variable that. Uh, what else? Uh, the Lagrangian uh, uh, <coughs> is minus p slope intercept, okay? The Lagrangian, uh, this that's the, the actual Lagrangian value here, plus one, okay? is the intercept, minus the intercept of the tangent line uh, for the uh, Hamiltonian. And vice versa, okay, minus velocity slope intercept, the actual intercept on the, on the vertical axis of the Hamiltonian, okay, and what we're talking about here is this number, 0.06, okay, uh, which is the Hamiltonian over here, that's uh, 0.06 right there for that particular uh, thing. That 0.06 shows up over here as the intercept with a minus sign. Now this diagram without the helps and the ideas actually is in the Russian text. I only discovered it recently. It's a, uh, sort of hidden in there. but. Uh, what I want to point out is, and this is really cool, this is where we're going uh, at the end of this course, but I, I want to give you a heads up on it. This is the relativistic wave mechanical derivation of all of these quantities. And I do believe I'm on the uh, correct thing, so I can turn this one right here, I hope, into the actual uh, thing that I can uh, click. And I'm going to blow it up here. This is now on the web, okay? But here, uh, what you have o over there, when we draw that diagram, is the diagram that you'd get on this one if I made the momentum really small. If I made it down here and just crammed all that stuff into there, it would be this diagram. Now let's see it in its glory. There's the actual quantum momentum, which is a k vector. There's the group velocity, which is the classical velocity. The group velocity is only a function of the Lagrangian function, which is a circle. And then you probably know that the relativistic Hamiltonian is a hyperbola. That's the Hamiltonian. It's a hyperbolic cosine. The Lagrangian, minus the Lagrangian, is the inverse of that secant. So when you get to relativity, looking at it this way, all of the complexity and mystery of the classical mechanics becomes trivial. It's trigonometry of both sines and hyperbolic sines, and cosines and tangents and cotangents. And there's mc squared right there. So this is a matter wave, obeying the rules that we kind of have here. These are both parabolas approximately. A circle and a hyperbola look pretty much the same if you only look about to there. But you can see the circle ends with the speed of light. You can't go any faster than that. But the momentum is no limit. The Lagrangian is flipped in the relativistic picture. That's why here over in the classical, it looks like you got two concave up. You're flipping them. Yep. This, the Lagrangian is really down here. Lagrangian, as we'll see, measures phase. And in order to measure phase, you have to have the distance between the antimatter and the matter. So we're talking some heavy stuff here. But it's simpler than that. The classical stuff is much more complicated and weird. This is just wave mechanics, simple wave mechanics of light. Okay, let's get back to business here. But I would encourage you to look carefully uh, at that particular uh, help. So, uh, this, all these rules are due to phase invariance principles wave mechanic phase invariant principles. And what I call Evenson's axiom, 
because even since it's the guy that measured the speed of light so accurately that now it's declared a constant. There's no plus or minus signs on it. It's the definition of the meter. Okay? But even since axioms is all colors go see, that is it almost proves itself. Okay, back to the classical world. Why do I get to really do that partial derivative with respect to P of a Lagrangian to be zero? And then over on the other side in the Hamilton world of the Irish uh, physics, okay, the partial derivative with respect to the velocity of a Hamiltonian. Zero identically. How do I get to say that when they're totally interconnected? How do I get to do that? Okay. All right, we're going to look here at not just tangent lines like that has, but also secant lines. We're going to imagine a secant line moving up to become a tangent line. What does that involve? Okay. So these are the secant lines. Lagrangian equal p dot v. That's you know, remember this this thing has a slope of p. Okay, uh, and the v is the independent variable. And then it has an intercept of minus h. Okay? So as you work this thing down and you look at your Hamiltonian and you say, hey, I've got to go down to just that point where my secant makes a tangent. And at that point, I will have uh, reached an extreme value for h. This is an extreme value. And that extreme value, the derivative of h with respect to v, is zero. That's where it comes from. That's the trick. Not explained even in a Russian text. But that's the trick. Okay? So, uh, this extreme point, this extreme intercept, is what allows us to make that statement. Okay? Partial h with respect to the velocity. Nothing. Okay? And then you do the reverse, you see. The, the, the idea is the partial h with respect to v is zero at each point where v is the partial h with respect to p. Each point on the Lagrangian with slope p equal partial l with respect to v. That's stating the first equation of Lagrange. Okay? And then go ahead and do the same thing with the Hamiltonian. It's got an extreme value. Okay, now it's the Lagrange that's getting the extreme value, and it'll be its partial, or in this case, because we only have one variable showing, of uh, derivative uh, is zero. Okay, extreme value of minus L. And remember, we have to do a minus because the circle bottom has to match the hyperbola bottom in relativistic quantum physics. Wow. Okay, so... These, these are, you know, something extra for mechanics. That just, uh, uh, you can find it in this room, and I can't find it anywhere else. Okay, now, let's make another analogy real quick here, because you're going to take thermodynamics probably, and you're going to run into these same mysteries. Okay? Internal energy is a function of entropy S in volume V. That's just a definition. They, they take these definitions very uh, uh, seriously in thermodynamics because it used to be literally true when they would do densities and functions. They would literally engrave on bronze the curves that described uh, and the variables that described a given quantity, say entropy, enthalpy, or uh, all of the, there's a whole bunch of Helmholtz free energy, you name it. There's, for uh, functions, and as you get more independent variables, you get more and more of these things, okay? But a new function here, enthalpy, and this is given an H, is a function of entropy and P for pressure, okay? So the Legendre transform for this is the product of the two variables that we're uh, arguing about, uh, plus the original uh, uh, function, whatever that was. In this case, it was internal energy. And energy is, the internal energy is now being uh, given a new variable, but that's a different function. It's got a different name. It's called enthalpy. Okay? And there's a th difference here is a minus sign. Let's put the two that we're working with uh, up here. 
Lagrangian instead of internal energy is defined as a function of position and velocity instead of entropy and volume. Okay? And the, uh, they were getting a new function here in place of infinitely I'm going to use Hamiltonian, which depends on position r, just like this one does, but also momentum has changed, you see, as the uh, independent variable for Hamiltonian. Okay? And here is uh, Poincare's relation with the Lagrangian. Okay? The difference in sign is just the way you scale. You could have defined a, a, a pressure. It's kind of an inward thing, so why would you put a minus sign on that? And they, I don't know anybody who does that, but you could. Okay, does this make sense? Okay, this is just insight into the weirdness of partial derivatives and their geometry. Okay, except for plus and minus sign, it's our Hamilton. New variable. All right. Legendre transformation is a special case, and this we're getting into some pretty important uh, heavy stuff. Uh, this, this thing uh, that we had there is uh, just a special case of what we call an active contact transformation generator. Okay? An action function, because it's active transformation. We're actually literally talking about something that goes and becomes something else. That does something to change, okay? So we have this double function here. S of little x and little y, and then big x and big y, okay? So the idea is, for every point uh, in this space here, but particular, every point on some curve that you decided you wanted to draw in this space, okay? For every one of those points, there is a whole curve over here. So what I'm doing with this function is I'm setting n equal to a constant, and then uh, I'm uh, picking a particular little x and y. So the only thing that's left that can vary is big X and big Y. So I go over and I look at what's going on in big X and big Y space, and I discover I could be anywhere uh, on, on this curve uh, right here. Okay, that, that would be true at this point. And then if I went to another point, it would be another curve nearby. I went down here, probably a curve down here, a completely different curve uh, down here. You see, I put a point up here, I get something up here. Okay? And then I go and look at the next point. The next point gives me a curve somewhere, well, it's continuous. It'll be, if I'm real close to this one, nearby. This I'm showing quite a distance uh, off to here. And then this point right here, gives me this curve, okay? So we set this thing to a constant, say 10, and this is what we're getting. And that's why it's called a contact transformation, because this curve is by contact transformation made into this curve. This curve definitely exists. I drew it with my hand, scratched it into the bronze, right? then I'm getting this one over the uh, aluminum or whatever you're using to, to scratch your graph of this uh, 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 function, you see. That's, this function doesn't exist. It's just tangent to this one. But if you do this enough times, you can see very quickly where that curve is. Contact transformation is very accurate because they're giving you a tangent. Not just points. They're giving you tangents at the point, right? And we've already kind of seen that with the parabola construction that involved the right angle, right? Okay, so that, that's kind of neat. And what I want to point out here is the Legendre transformation is a contact transformation, but it's doing it not with curves, just with straight lines. It's making a whole bunch of tangents uh, that can then make a curve over here whose tangents will make this curve back again. And that's the whole thing about a contact transformation. If I stop on this curve, I'm going to get stuff over here that's going to be contacting this guy. Now, where have you seen something like this in an elementary text? The Huygens name comes up, right? When you make wave fronts, you make it by contacting a whole bunch of oval or circular wave fronts, right? That, that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about wave mechanics right here. 
So this is the wave mechanics basis of our classical, well, uh, certainly mechanics, but also thermodynamics. So when you go uh, here, over here, you're going to be looking at a straight line for a particular point and so forth. Okay? So here's your Hamiltonian's function of P. Here's your Lagrangian as a function of Q dot. I'm now using the, the professional uh, symbolism uh, for coordinates. Generalized coordinates. Okay? Now, this, this, is, this is kind of weird right here. This, this thing, uh, the, the differential of this action function, the thing that does an active transformation. I, I'm tongue-in-cheek putting those two uh, letters with act in it uh, together, two words together, uh, but I, I suspect that back somewhere that is actually uh, uh, where uh, the name action came from, but I, I can't nail that down yet. But anyway, the differential of action, that's the Lagrangian times dt, okay, gives me p times velocity dt, okay, or p dq, this coordinate, uh, used to use x, but now we're using uh, the queer q, okay, and then minus h dt. Okay, so that, that's just a, a thing to notice. And then what are we talking about there? What we're really talking about is by de Broglie's thing, which came in 1929, associated momentum with h times the wave vector, or 1900 when Planck associated energy with frequency, you've got k dr minus omega dt. Now if that integrates, it's kr minus omega t. That's phase of a matter wave, right there. Kx minus omega t. So that's what Poincaré was getting at. Poincaré was just about to discover all of the stuff about quantum mechanics and relativity together with a ruler and compass. That's what this diagram over here uh, that we looked at on the computer uh, is all about. And we're going to be getting to that chapter. But I just wanted to show you how this stuff connects with everything we do. Everything. Extraordinary claim means extraordinary proof, and that will be uh, in unit A. Okay? And it's basically high school geometry. Okay, well let's do a contact transformation that we can really understand. This is something you would throw at sophomores. Maybe even the 700 sophomores that, that you're dealing with in those classes. Okay, uh, wow. Did you uh, maybe ask asking it too much. It wasn't a reading. They don't do two-dimensional kinematics until like halfway through the semester. Okay. So it's kind of out of their reach. I mean, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. That's it, absolutely right. But it is now. Yeah, it should it's be. still early. So. <laughs> but uh, let's do it anyway. Okay? Now this affects two things. Something very big and something very small. Okay? Tiny little, uh, where they let some uh, uh, krypton or some other rare, uh, some of the first potassium, sodium, you name it. Something that's, that's good. Uh, properties for laser uh, uh, studies, they let a bunch of that go and it just expands and falls. That's what's going on here. This is an atom ball expanding at a constant rate that was given by a okay? As the center falls constantly uh, uh, with the acceleration, a g, okay? And it maintains contact points on the envelope of all of the trajectories. And that's what we want to do. We want to make a contact transformation from the parameters of classical trajectory analysis and the actual plume that shows up here very beautifully on the uh, uh, Jupiter moon, Eel. And there's another one down here that you'd never tell that that was, but you get clearer pictures of this thing from other angles. There are quite a number of these things in that first uh, flight to the moon of Eo. 
Okay, so let's look at these uh, guys here. Uh, and <clears throat> before we do, uh, let me get this thing up to speed here so that we can run a uh, animation that won't interfere too much uh, with what we're uh, doing uh, here. So I'm going to start this one, I hope. Both machines are now on the real website, not the uh, guest website. There we go. Bang! All these particles, red particles, these little red guys, have the same initial velocity, spe same initial speed. And now you're seeing the envelope emerging tangent to that blast wave, if you will. I'm going to use that terminology even though we, every one of these particles uh, does this sort of, of thing. And so I can pause this thing uh, right there and then uh, it's okay for me to just go ahead and start another one. This time I didn't give it very much velocity. So I get a little bitty bitty uh, parabolic shape thing. Okay. Uh, when I do that. And the gravity hasn't changed at all. Do another one uh, here. Okay, so that's what I want to analyze, and that's what I want uh, you to spend some time with on next week's uh, problem set. Okay, and we'll, we'll have a number of examples of things uh, like this, and I'm going to pause it right there. But this is just, you know, gorgeous structure of geometry and uh, physics. It's uh, really nice. I, I think it's, um, you know, a piece of artwork uh, as well as being um, very germane to uh, our uh, culture that uh, requires very precise time. And I'll look at the stars, or the planets anyway. Okay, so let's uh, see what it is uh, we need. Well, the very first thing we need is the UP1. Uh, formulas for, for, for trajectory. As you have already pointed out, they don't do the Y, they're just doing sort of the X. But um, uh, we're doing both here. And so we're going to have an initial velocity cosine and, and the, uh, the uh, velocity Y will be v, the initial speed of sine. So there's your initial velocity coordinates. And then um, the X uh, the, the, uh, the x time uh, that we're talking about uh, will depend on the angle of the trajectory that you fire. Okay, if you fired it straight up here, cosine of zero is one. So uh, your, your x, I'm sorry, cosine of 90 degrees would be zero. So this thing would move; it just goes straight up and comes straight down. Otherwise, it would have a velocity that was uniform uh, across uh, the board as the y does a parabolic time, a plot that's really not shown here. We've got plotting versus time, we're plotting y versus x. So that makes this problem a little bit harder. And then substitute the time value of this guy right here, x over cosine. I put that into the y's uh, here, uh, wherever I see a time. And I get this. This is the actual uh, equation of one trajectory for a particular value of the launch angle, starting with zero, say, and going up. And we really don't need to discuss to, uh, below zero here because it would just be the negative of one shot over here. So I could just take my angle above 90 degrees if I wanted. I'll look at those. And uh, there we go. Uh, this becomes very simple tangent minus inverse uh, cosine squared. That's in that's a, in, that's a secant squared uh, that will be part of our uh, function. So here's the deal. Here's where you make an active contact transformation generator. You make it so that you have two quantities that you're using as parameters. Velocity. I pick my speed, my initial speed. Uh, I shouldn't say velocity, I mean speed, uh, V0, okay, and a certain angle, say 45 degrees here, 60 degrees here, 75 degrees uh, there, okay? 
And for each of those, I get, if it's the first one, and you, I get this red curve. That's where it was 45. That's actually the maximum range. And we can uh, know that this, this envelope that we're going to get from the action, the, a contact transformation, uh, is the dashed line there. Okay, but we'd like to calculate that. And uh, we're going to be setting this action function to zero. Okay, so that's just rewriting our equation here. Okay, and uh, then uh, this point right here is going to give me this, and it's going to touch right there. That's the contact point. And then this guy right here, the high riser, okay, he's going to contact here. And then, of course, there'd be 90 degrees, which would contact it right there. Pretty clear? Okay. Now, these optimization uh, things, what you're doing is optimizing. Uh, you're finding optimal points out of a whole family of curves. So, uh, that's very important in wave mechanics because you, your optimal points are where the wave actually exists. The rest of the stuff is all interference and it just disappears. This is a Huygens idea. So um, what we what we are uh, really doing here is doing an algebraic optimization. You should not expect the algebra for problems like this to be simple. Even this one. It's going to take the whole page here, and I'm going to run through it very fast. Okay, so uh, let's get started. It does. Okay. Okay. So don't expect uh, easy algebra for uh, optimization problems, even for uh, the sophomore physics-based uh, 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 problem. Okay. So I'm going here, and I, I get my partial with respect to alpha the tangent. And I've got this, uh, this secant squared or inverse cosine, the second power. So I end up with uh, basically that uh, equation equals zero as the equation for the envelope. But let's simplify it some more so we really recognize uh, what it is. I can go through there and get rid of uh, cosine squared and leave this as just a cosine. Q lost its square. What else did I do here? I canceled some twos. I got rid of an x. So it's looking good, but you still have a lot of work uh, to turn this into an equation for the envelope, which is this thing. Okay, and that can be simplified a little bit. So when you're done, you've got a very simple envelope function. It's a parabola in x, but it's a big parabola. It develops every one of the things and contacts them perfectly uh, to make this parabola. All right, that's the algebraic approach to this thing. What I'd like to look is the geometrical development of it, because that's where it's really showing you the guts of the whole structure. Before I do that, we take some other pictures here that show this. Now, it is remarkable that you do get a, very, a pretty sharp, in all of these images, and there, there are literally hundreds of them now, volcanoes on not just EO, there are, and it turns out Jupiter makes every one of these planets uh, do some active things, and often that's volcanic. But the idea that I do get a pretty sharp line here, because we're assuming the approximation that every one of the particles that came out of that little poof had the same velocity, same speed, right? The same speed, okay? So that that's to be noted. Uh, it's an idealization, like everything we do in theoretical uh, physics. Okay. Now, here are links to uh, some of the things on the NASA so you can get to look at this. And this is what I call NASA's artwork being bad. This is a pretty bad sketch of plumes. <laughs> it looks like, uh, I, I mean, th these guys need a geometry lesson, right? Uh, <clears throat> so, um, I, I say I call it the Las Vegas model of planetary ejecta. It's like one of the fountains at, at Las Vegas. And, uh, doesn't make a parabola for some reason. Okay, now here's what we're going to use. We're going to use our kites. Remember the kite? Here's the directrix. Okay. At just exactly the distance that the umbilical point of the uh, parabola, which is turned over here, but it's going to be the other way now. Uh, those two are equal, okay? That's the P factor that goes with 4 for x squared equal uh, uh, y. 
sometimes constant, constant 4p, all right? But the main thing is that these kites, you see, are used as a scale for their slope. This is a slope scale here, and right now we're at 1p, 2p. That's the slope of this uh, thing uh, here. And we've taken p equal to 1 here, so that's the slope of 2 right there. And then this is a slope of 1, and you remember, always slope of 1 uh, is opposite the point where the fo we call the focus sits. All right? And then if you're inside that, uh, the kite has been reduced to a square, you get uh, rhombohedral uh, kites uh, for the rest of them. The same rules apply uh, with that, the, the slope uh, indicator uh, is, is of, of use there. That's the uh, <clears throat> indicator that comes uh, off of the center of the kite. That's the indicator right there. So where that hits, this line, is uh, the slope of that thing, and it's right at the half, slope of a half. There's slope of one, which is what this one is sitting at. Okay, remember that stuff? Well, maybe not, but we're going to use it anyway. Okay, and I'm going to ask you to, you know, make use of this on that problem. Now, there's some questions that we can answer here that uh, lead to a geometrical description. So I'm going to give you lots of graph paper with, uh, uh, you know, blast uh, indicators of initial speed. Okay, and the idea is to, you know, figure out where the points are. And the first one you look at is alpha equal 90 degrees. Okay, and in this case that rises very nicely to this point, and then comes back down. So that's one trajectory, okay? And so we know the envelope is going to uh, go through there. And it's just a question of what's going to do, you know, all down here. And of course, this will be symmetric, so we only have to get on one side. All right? <clears throat> so we, we, we're going to be asking about the focus of the trajectory and the focus of the envelope. They're both parabolas. And that's very often the case with uh, optimization problems. The optimization uh, obviously has one uh, thing selected. Everything else is just uh, the, that thing with different numbers. And then the one thing that we should uh, always worry about is the blast wave. Well, not always, because at time zero, it's just here, and then here, and then here. It hasn't reached the envelope yet. It only reaches it right there, and then it goes scooting out uh, along the envelope very rapidly. And you can see that if we rerun the animation of the uh, explosion uh, on the uh, screen there. Okay, now... <clears throat> The question is, how high can the alpha equal 45 degree path uh, rise? Well, uh, the alpha equal 45 degree path is the one that has a parabola going to the maximum, wherever the maximum is. So that's the next one to look at, besides alpha equal 90. Uh, and then you can look at 30 and all of the others in between. So where is the focus? In that case, the focus is right here at the inside. So, so uh, our, our uh, parabola over here uh, with the, um, that we have uh, there, the focus is right there, you see. This one, the focus is about there, where it's not 45 degrees slope outside, okay? And then this one right here, uh, the envelope has a focus right at that point, which we're going to find out, and the slope is about 45 right there. So uh, that gives us some idea how this geometry is going to be uh, working out. And then the question is, the next question is, where on the x-axis uh, does this uh, uh, thing hit? Uh, the, uh, the, this x-axis goes through the focus uh, here. Okay. So um, we're going to be using a little bit of algebra on this, but if you go through the algebra, uh, you can just go, just uh, show, that first of all, center, center falls as, a, as far as the 90 degree ball goes. So where is the blast wave, okay? Well, you, 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 you just imagine that you dropped a ball uh, uh, from uh, this point 
uh, you can, uh, you know, the, the whole sphere that you see there that has a center that is just falling like a ball would fall. We let it go at this point and it just starts falling like a, 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 a ball. Now how do you know that? That's the Einstein elevator uh, idea. If I um, get into the uh, frame of falling, that is if I just fall with this stuff at the at time equals zero, I will always be at the center of the blast circle. I'll just see them all going away from me at the same speed. That's a little bit of a more complicated a Galilean transformation. It's one where the velocity is varying, but um, it, it, it's a way that you can understand that that blast wave is like falling just like a single point down the axis of the uh, uh, object. Okay. So, to make a long story short, we know that the parabolic kite, that's this guy right here, uh, is going to be giving us the uh, values for the 45 degree uh, launch. Okay. And we've got this much distance here, so we know that that's the range right there. And uh, that tells you, you know, that particular trajectory. Okay. And uh, see if there's anything else I can say. Uh, we can. This is a guess for the all-path envelope and for its focus, that the envelope of the entire set of curves, and where its focus is, where its directory is. Those are all things that uh, come out of, a, of basically a geometrical uh, thing. Now, uh, given that the slope is uh, 45 degrees there, I know that the center of the blast wave is right here at this particular moment. At this particular moment when this thing got to here, the blast wave center got to there. So we can draw a, a circle uh, right now that represents where the the, uh, where the blast wave is, and of course it's centered here, so it's going to come over and touch there, and then go way down here. Okay. So we're, we're already getting pretty good information about the internal structure of this envelope. Now, uh, this particular parabola has a directrix right here, a focus right here. Okay, that becomes very clear because of this 45 degree. Uh, a slope. Okay, what else can we do here? Uh, this keeps going a little bit here. This is a picture now of what I am sure is my, uh, I know my parabola hits here, I know it hits here, so I'm done drawing the envelope. That That is the picture of the envelope. And then this is the blast circle. At the moment, uh, the particles hit the uh, that particular point uh, from the blast wave. Okay. So th this, this is basically the um, sort of reasoning that I'm going to be asking for on that problem. Now, uh, there are a couple of things. The focus for the individual trajectory and the focus for the entire family envelope have to be on the same line. They must line up. And that, that's kind of a cool thing. So uh, here's a point on the uh, uh, thing right here for a parabola. Other parabolas will be uh, elsewhere. But the idea is if you, you do a construction of a parabola, be it this one, or this one, okay, you're doing it with, uh, uh, say, a string that goes uh, to the focus. So both of these, uh, if I just stop right here, I would be drawing a, uh, a uh, curve that is this one, the blue one. But if I use this focus here, I'm drawing a curve that's much bigger, that's the uh, uh, envelope parabola right here. So th that is what I mean by having them for each point uh, that uh, 
or these meet, the foci have to be on the same. Now, what that's going to imply is that all the foci lie in a circle. And the idea is to prove that uh, just by physics, but uh, geometry is giving it uh, right here. Okay. So, uh, let's see if there's anything. So maximal horizontal range from to tangent, that circle, blah, blah, blah. Um, I think that's pretty much it. But anyway, uh, what you've got is the little kite that describes the actual trajectory, and then twice the size of that, in this case, is a big kite that goes with that particular point on the envelope. Okay. So the little kite uses this as a, a focus, and then the bigger uh, kite is this one right here. Now, you go to another angle, like alpha equals 30 degrees, that same thing happens, but it's a lot clearer uh, what's going on there. This is a picture with uh, 30 degrees, sort of a rough uh, one, but um, you can uh, see uh, envelope contact points and you can see the kite that goes with the entire upper level right here, okay? Its directrix is up here. This is where the directrix is at half that distance from the focus uh, for the uh, actual trajectory, okay? And, and can you see the uh, kite that lives uh, for it? Here's the big kite right here. There's the little one that goes with the this particular trajectory. Okay. So both of them are meeting here. This is just a, an arbitrary point, more or less, uh, uh, on the, uh, uh, each one of the curves. But that is an optimal point, a contacting point. And that's the key to uh, all of these uh, uh, things here. So um, I think we're over time here, some more uh, information on that, but I'm going to force us to stop before I solve the whole problem. Okay? This is a brain stretcher. There's a lot going on here when you look at it from different ways. So you just do algebra, you miss all this. The geometry lets you see the guts. Boy, is that true for QM and relativity. That really opens up a world. Okay. We'll see you. Have a good weekend. And we'll uh, do some more stuff like this uh, next week.